Welcome to the The Low Carb Carb Athlete Athlete Podcast, Podcast. where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey guys, it's Debbie, and have you used a CGM before? CGM is Continuous Glucose Monitor, and there's different options out there. Ideally, you can get it from your doctor, but they seem to just want to wait until you're type 2 diabetic and not be preventative. I would like us to take ownership of our health and make choices now to prevent having high, low glucose readings and optimize your health from the inside out by testing and not guessing. And that includes a CGM that goes on for 14 days and you can order one via NutriSense. And a CGM is giving you glucose updates with a small device on the back of your arm, 24 seven. Totally easy, I actually did a video on my YouTube channel, Low Carb Athlete, how to apply this CDM, first time, kind of scared, but it doesn't hurt. But it gives you real-time glucose readings. Glucose response to meals, you'll learn about what foods are reactive to you, and that could be a healthy food that you think is great, but it could raise your glucose. Simple things as stevia, for me, raise my glucose. Chewing gum, raise my glucose. Stress, when I'm driving a car and there's traffic, raises my glucose. Every stress response is a glucose response. So learn how to manage your stress. Learn learn how to pick right foods for you, unless you can, you know, do other lab testing and figure out vibrant wellness food zoomers, but it's kind of expensive for people. So if you can wear a CGM, it's a great way to learn about stress, food, exercise, stacking movement with your nutrition, figure out how to balance your blood sugar. So we want to learn more about how to exercise and eat or not eat. And morning cortisol, does it raise your glucose? If there's hidden stressors at nighttime, does your glucose go up higher while you're sleeping? So it gives us lots of clues that we can put in our investigation when we are working on your personalized fueling training and performance program to improve fat loss, performance, and longevity. So head to NutriSense website, NutriSense.io, how it works. You can learn more about your habits, your routines, your relationship to food, a little bit more, great app to use, and it can sync on to different programs. So you can put it all together. So if you want to get started with your journey in NutriSense, I suggest this to all my clients. Use at least 30 days. So you can do a 30-day, 90-day different programs, but you can pick which one you want. You get the sensor in the mail, put it on, last for 14 days, sync it to the nap, and get your readings on there. And then if you're doing my VIP coaching program, I'm working with you to correlate this data together. So begin your health optimization journey with NutriSense, and you can save on your order with our code, as usual, low carb athlete. So no carbs is not our goal, it's carb timing and using NutriSense, can, you can help figure out your nutrient dense whole food plan and when to adjust your macros based on your exercise intensity duration based on your life stressors and learn more. So it's nice to have this data. So test and not guess with NutriSense. Let me know how you like it. Hey, it's Debbie Potts, and I am bringing back the podcast to talk about how to best fuel, train, and perform for the unique you to improve the aging process. So if you're like me, you're at about around 50 years old and entering the second half of your life, we may need to do things a little differently. And what if you're short on time and you're trying to fit all this stuff in and you're just doing too much of everything and you are stressed out? My story, chronic stress, how it impacts the whole you from the inside out. So how we train to increase our performance, improve our fat burning engine, to improve our speed and power and strength. So 
I love testing. I became an FDM practitioner so I could do functional lab testing and use that with my nutritional therapy training as a practitioner and TP and use a nutritional therapy assessment. Combining the labs and the assessment together as a nutritional therapist, pretty fascinating. So I'm more of a health investigator these days, helping athletes avoid going through what I went through starting back in 2013. So now I'm on a mission and following my purpose of working with like-minded driven individuals who tend to do too much of everything. So what is the right amount for you? It's the Goldilocks effect. Not too much, not too little, just that right dose to create a positive effect. And today we're going to talk to Daniel Crumback, who I did his metabolic expert training to learn how to better be a practitioner with my Pinoy metabolic testing equipment. And Dr. Crumback, Daniel created an amazing course and ran the program for Pinoy and does some different things now, but it has a huge, uh, extensive resume and just an expert in a lot of things, lots of trainings and more we'll go into when we get started, but I wanted to bring him on the show to talk about the heart rate training zones and what do we identify when we're doing lab testing? What is appropriate for males versus females? And if we're endurance athletes training too much volume, as I do Dr. Stacey Sims menopausal course 2.0, super fascinating because women we can't do the same thing we used to do and expect to get the same results. So insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So if we are doing long distance cardio, Stacey Sims in the course just said, well, cortisol is released from exercise, all exercise for men and women over 45 minutes. I've been told for years, your cortisol will go up. If women, if we're already stressed pre post menopause age, we need to use that that increase in stress from exercise is best to not do extensive cardio in zone two because that could actually store fat rather than burn fat. Instead, we should use that time exercising. Our training session should include two to four max days with HIIT training intervals or short intensity intervals, 20, 30 second sprints. And I talk about that with my clients doing zone two and then finishing with, so you kind of do a warm up and warm down. And then the midsection, the meat and potatoes is now going to be more high intensity interval training, speed work. So we'll talk to Daniel about that, uh, how to test our fat burn oxidation rates, strength intervals, strength training intervals versus endurance training. How do we know where we should spend more time with? So a lot of that we identify in Pinoy metabolic testing that I am doing here in North San Diego, the resting metabolism test and the exercise test. And then we can really personalize workout program because right now we're just guessing. You don't really know. You don't know what you don't know. So how can you create a personalized training program, ideally with a coach that can guide you and keep course correcting and keeping you accountable is really important to invest in a coach. You know, it's like two, $300 a month to invest in making sure you're having someone check on you every week. Are you doing the right things that you need to do? So, you know, I use training peaks and then check on my clients, biometrics and data to make sure we're on the road to where we're trying to get to. So Daniel will help us out a little bit. So let's bring him on the show today. Thanks for listening and send in your questions afterwards. Maybe we can have him back on. All right, guys, I'm excited to have one of my mentors on metabolic expert, metabolic analysis training, Daniel Crumback, who Daniel, you have like 20 different uh, (laughs) abbreviations after your name, but you're very well versed in this world of excess physiology and you're a certified excess physiologist, high performance specialist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, physiotherapist, sport physiotherapist, and more. So thanks for making time to come on our show and help us, our endurance athlete world, understand how to be their best self as we age. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Debbie. And where are you located? Let's, you're up in the right, UK. Right now, I, I, I it's hard to it's hard to keep track of me. I was <laughs> uh, I was it was two years in China working with uh, as the head of performance rehab, working with Chinese Olympic athletes, and then I went to the Olympics with uh, China, 
And then I went to Greece to work two years for a metabolic analysis company as their head of science and education. In the last two years, I have been in England, the south of England, uh, running a consultation business plus uh, a lecturer at the University of Chichester in exercise physiology and physiotherapy. Yeah. And I'm about to take off and move to northern England in Cumbria, uh, which is as far as you can go before I hit Scotland. Mm. And I'm going to be living in the Pennines and uh, running a practice up there as well as continuing with international consultancy. So is your focus athletes up there? Is that kind of the... What's what's really interesting, it always has been, like for the first 20 years, it was athletes and primarily uh, endurance athletes, although I also work freestyle skiing, uh, downhill mountain biking as well. Um, but, um, over the last couple of years, uh, working with different companies, uh, I've also really developed on the medical side as well. So, um, and I find this is very helpful to people who work with athletes is to know what abnormal physiology is. Um, and that gives them a better ability to analyze the data when they know what the spectrum, full spectrum is. So I also now work with people with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular and respiratory conditions as well. Yeah. So that's why I want to bring you on the show because I love testing and not guessing and really personalizing coaching programs for clients, not just endurance athletes, but just help people improve the aging process. And especially as I'm 50 now, it's just like how to improve the second half of your life, I think is so essential for athletes and non-athletes. But everyone's always struggling to figure out okay, how to burn fat, what should I eat, how should I train, and how should I you know, move each day, and what type of training, strength training or HIIT training should I do? And there's so much confusion out there. But that's why I love metabolic testing. I own a metabolic testing kit, trying to get that started here in North San Diego, and I told you previously, I used to do new leaf testing back in 2005. So I've been in the area for a long time. And I always find it so fascinating how stress and all the other things can impact the results and how we can test, figure out where th- that person is right now and create a program for them. So you're just not just guessing. So why do you like metabolic testing? Why do you think it's important? Um. It, for me, it was a journey as well. Um, many, many years ago, I started off with uh, Jörg Feldman in uh, Northern British Columbia because as a physio, I was working in Penticton, British Columbia. It was home of Ironman. Um, and I was working with a lot of athletes and I felt I didn't have as much knowledge uh, that I needed to be working with this special group. Um, so I took myself uh, up to Quenell, which is in the middle of nowhere. With this amazing man from Switzerland, uh, I just continued to work with him for years, including uh, doing on-site testing for cross-country skiers. So, in other words, just standing in the snow, uh, <laughs> having skiers going around a one-kilometer route while we were taking lactate measurements at that point and heart rate. Wow! So I I started, you know, thirty years ago in lactate measurement called lactate balance point was the, what was being used at this time. Um, and then after about six years, we realized that it wasn't working. Uh, we were getting, uh, we weren't getting the metrics that we needed to be really accurate. Um, and then we moved into metabolic analysis and then further from that into near infrared spectroscopy. I added spirometry as being a really important component because I kept finding respiratory limitations to performance and I needed, I knew that uh, in order to be able to determine how I was going to train them, I needed to differentiate uh, the type of respiratory condition or limitation they had. And um, since then, I also add in uh, things like uh, body composition as well. So those are the mm-hmm. the main four that I use now. Um, but it's, it's 25, 30 years of testing and analysis uh, to be able to determine what their best combination is. And I'm the same as you. I, I just, I hate guessing. Um, I've divided my groupings. And it's funny that you mentioned, you know, the clientele I'm working with, you know, just thinking about redesigning my website is the fact that I have, you have your medical group who is interested in becoming uh, healthy. Mm-hmm. You've got your 
middle group, which are the general population and the weekend warriors who want to improve function and longevity is the big thing, right? Longevity seems to be the key word right now. And then your athletes want to improve performance, but you have to be able to communicate with them and know physiology from the three different groups. Um, and I think the the one thing about that combination of testing is you you can know in each of the groups if you know how to analyze the data well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I find is is hard to say as as a business owner. I just focus on just endurance athletes, but because you want to help everyone that is struggling, there's you're supposed to narrow it down. But I never find that possible. It's like, yes, I, my avatar client is me that is a high performer endurance athlete trying to do tends to do too much of everything and how to find the right amount to create the minimal effective dose and training. And then fueling, because that's what we've been talking a lot about on the show is people doing the right nutrition and how to match their nutrition with their fueling. But ideally, everyone should ideally be focusing on their future self and what they're going to be doing and feeling and operating and moving when they're 80, 90 years old. So I I hope all of our athletes are, you know, training for their future self. But also, lastly, I'll, I'll say that I see a lot of athletes out there just with a bunch of triathletes the other weekend, and there's a lot of overweight athletes. And so there's a lot of people, I think this is what brought me into more of my holistic approach is that you see people at triathlons, runners, you know, they're working out, but they're not losing weight and trying to yep. understand people. Are you struggling trying to lose fat weight when you think you're doing all the right things and you're doing the training but are you doing the rest of the stuff? And that's why I created the holistic method because there's a lot of overweight athletes. And so, you know, how can we help them if that's a goal, if they want to lose weight, but so why, why should we do testing metabolic testing? If you are looking at fat loss performance or longevity, why should we get a test done? Why should we invest in that time and money? Well, as you are aware, the, you know, you, you have three different systems that we can measure through metabolic analysis. And then you have the endocrine system or the hormonal system, which is separate, which is super complex. And, uh, and I, I would love to add it to the repertoire, but generally you, you get that through questions and through uh, talking with physicians as well. Um, but any one of those systems can limit health, uh, longevity, function, or performance. Um, the reason why I like metabolic analysis so much is that, that it will give me a clear idea of what system is causing the limitation or system or systems, depending on the person. Um, And that allows me to direct the training program to be able to address the, the, the largest limiting factor. And I think uh, that's, you end up getting much better results and not only do you get better results, but there's an efficiency component too. Um, There's, if you're an elite athlete and you're sponsored and you can afford to make mistakes in your training, as long as you don't injure yourself mm-hmm. uh, and you don't overtrain. Whereas the average person has a very limited period of time to be able to dedicate to training and to their nutrition. So therefore um, for you to be accurate uh, will improve their efficiency. And their and when you do that, then they're sold on the concepts. And I think it's how we explain um, how these systems, even if your respiratory system is your limitation, it can still severely limit your metabolic and your cardiovascular system. But if you address those two other systems, it's not going to fix your respiratory problem. Mm. So that ability to be able to really focus in on the limiting system and be able to give the appropriate training. And then if you have a good coach, and as you know, um, you have to match your findings with their goal. And that's the fun part is there, there's a training program specifically for every triathlon that's out there, depending on altitude and temperature and, uh, and, and, and gain, uh, elevation gain, et cetera. Um, but that's for that race. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily meet, it doesn't even need to match the individual. That's the best way of training for that race. But you have the ability through metabolic analysis to actually uh, tweak the program uh, to improve the limitations. And probably the, one of the biggest things with metabolic analysis is the setting of intensity zones. Mm-hmm. It is 
the most accurate way of setting intensity zones. And if you can accurately set intensity zones, then you know the physiological gains that you're going to make. Whereas, uh, as you know, all the other systems that are out there are art science, they're math. So that's the other <laughs> but thing. you say that multiple times in your videos in the course I took. It's science, not math. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything times a percentage is math. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's FTP. It doesn't matter if it's lactate threshold. It doesn't matter if it's anaerobic threshold, however you're calculating it. It's a calculation. Uh, and usually it's based upon one, one metric at one point. Mm -hmm. And I, as, as you know, I'm very big on the fact that there needs to be multiple metrics and correlating over a trend for it to be accurate, not by snapping and say, oh, anaerobic threshold is 174 beats. So therefore, and you're going, no, that's not how our systems work. So uh, I think that's probably the key thing is I would have a hell of a time designing an intensity based program uh, without the use of metabolic analysis. Yeah, because then you're just guessing where they should be is not as accurate. And you don't know baseline. So when you ideally test them again three months later or so that you see changes, and how do you know if you've improved or not really without seeing baseline data that you're collecting? Yeah, and having multiple metrics, you have yes. the ability to check multiple metrics to see that they've improved. Was that the thing that improved them? Um, and as you know, the the number one thing for setting a, a good program is intensity. Mm -hmm. And yet it's the least understood. Um, you know, you have, you have tons of people who will take, will send out triathletes and say, well, I want you to improve your speed. So therefore I want you to do 10 by 400s uh, with, and I want you to walk a hundred and you're going, where are you getting these numbers from? It's, this is a, this is a mythical program, not based upon the individual's capability. And I think that's uh, where we need to be. The, the word I use is called respectful training. It's it's it needs to be it needs to respect the individual, and it should be more individualized. And the way to individualize it is by thorough testing and retesting and adjustment of the programming. Yeah, for sure. I love that because that's even what I do as a more of a health investigator when I'm doing functional lab testing is that you're collecting clues. And that's why I really wanted to do the metabolic testing again, because it goes right hand in hand with my blood chemistry panel and look at hormones and look at GI tests. And then you can really create the ideal personalized program for somebody putting those, collecting more data, putting the missing pieces of puzzle together to then figure out a program for that individual with their exercise, nutrition, and health. Yeah, well, for example, like with some of the international consulting I do um, around the world, they send me data and I do the analysis and I give the I do interviews with the uh, the client, and they find that better, even though that they're they're testing, let's say in Georgia, um, they find it better for their clients if they send me the data and then I do the review, then they follow my recommendations for the next eight to twelve weeks and retests. Um, and we had a, a very interesting case that was, if you did not know the medical side, even though this person was a, a was a, um, a higher level athlete, um, I picked up the fact that the max heart rate was flattening out in the last two minutes. And, and, and there was no, there were cardiovascular history, no beta blockers, nothing like that. Um, went through the respiratory system, was performing well, went through the metabolic system, was performing well. Um, and I went back to medications to find out, uh, the person was on antidepressants and, um, had ADHD and those medications can stunt max heart rates. Mm -hmm. So it was it, being able to pick up that stuff and say, well, it's that medication that's limiting you. I'm not suggesting that you get off the medication. I said, yeah, talk to your no. doctor <laughs> about the ramifications and whether you, you know, if you want to be able to perform harder, you're going to have to either change medication that has less profound effects. Um, and they, they would discuss it with their physician. But that's the type of thing the average person doesn't know. Um, and, and you can pick up all these subtleties. You can pick up overtraining beautifully mm -hmm. uh, as well. Um, you know, a really stunted uh, heart rate recovery in the first one minute or VCO2 recovery in the first two minutes. Um, that's, a, it's a very key sign. Obviously your resting heart rate going up 
uh, and having um, you know other metrics going up at the same time are good. But you know, with metabolic analysis, you can pick up really key things to be able to pick these other things up. So let's kind of walk through the test. If you're doing a metabolic test and you have a great way to personalize, figure out what the pro protocol should be. Let's kind of just walk through that. And then I wanted to get into the zones that we identify because that's a whole other conversation, but so many people don't train right. And they don't do the the short intensity interval sprints, right. With the recovery and then the high intensity interval speed work that we keep all hearing about then the zone two. So let's kind of walk through for everyone. What is a basic test? How do we create that personalized protocol? If we can just summarize that. Yeah. Um, it's after about five years of testing, I got frustrated because, you know, even talking with my mentors, it was sort of like, ah, oh, well, if it's a woman and she's a fairly good cyclist, she'll be starting at about a hundred Watts and you can go up by about 20 Watts. And I, for me, for my protocols to be strict, uh, and for me not to miss the bottom end or the top end and not for the test, not to be excessively long depending on which test I'm doing, right? Whether I'm doing a, a ramp or whether I'm doing a step, um, w- for which I would be after different pieces of information for either of those. Um, what I did was I created a, what, what, I, what I call a parameter check, and a lot of people are using it now, which is uh, it's based upon, I know that I want to capture data that's around 100 beats, that will make sure I start low enough. So what I do is I'll set whatever wattage or whatever speed um, it, to be able to achieve about 100 beats. And that way I'm not going to miss the bottom end. So when they switch from mainly uh, fat to carbohydrate, you don't want to miss that point. Um, if you do, you're you're not going to be accurate with recovery or even potentially zone two. Um, and then making sure that it's of an appropriate length to achieve your goals. And what I do is I, I get them to tell me what would be a nine out of 10. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking for that top wattage or speed that they're going to be able to push if they pushed it for two minutes. And then it, it's a simple case of one minus the other divided by the number of steps you want. So if you want, uh, if you want nine to 12, uh, 12 minutes, then you just divide it by nine and it will give you the increments. And that's, it doesn't take long. A parameter check with me takes about five minutes. Uh, I don't believe in standardized protocols um, for the company I was working with before. It was all standardized and, you know, I don't agree with it. It doesn't take long to be able to get the information and the data is too important. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, this will give you a really good split of your data over the time. And you, you'll be able to see clearly the, the changes in fuel systems that they're using as they go along. Yeah. So I think parameter check is extremely important, whether it's um, people say, well, you know, this person doesn't want to run. And, and as you know, I, I create I created uh, walking protocols um, and, and uh, with combinations of walking and, and inclination for hikers. Um, it all it doesn't if you use that same system, it doesn't matter what you test them on. Uh, it works every time. And I also do endurance based ones, uh, with my endurance athletes, which are 52 minutes in length. Um, and, and the again, point of just, that is to see what their heart rate and fuel sources at different intensities. That that's much more about fuel sources. And I really look at the near infrared spectroscopy results, um, using Moxie or Nox. Um, you can, you can be able to see. Uh, how well they're delivering versus utilization. That's a, the big thing, right? Which systems are the limitation? Because it's always one or the other in there. It's either a delivery problem or a utilization problem of three systems. Mm. And uh, with the data from that, uh, it gives me a clearer idea of if I want to do race planning on their nutrition, it gives me a lot better idea because it gives me 10 minutes at each intensity. Um and uh, your body reaches homeostasis within five to seven minutes. So it really does give you a clear idea of whether they can continue this for 30 minutes or two hours and mm-hmm. stay in the same fuel source. So I, I find that a lot better for race and training planning. Yeah. 
So when you're doing the testing, what we want to look at are the different fuel sources at different intensities. And then we create the zone training that we were talking about, that there's the five zones that they use typically. And what are you looking at when you're testing for an athlete? I mean, we can break it down if they want to improve fat loss, which is, you know, two different zones probably, and performance gains in longevity, but we look at training when we're doing the testing, what fuel sources correlate with the zones and we can kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So at at the lower intensities, what you're looking for is the body will normally be able to work at a lower heart rate with about 90% uh, fat, even maybe even a hundred percent. So on a metabolic analysis result, uh, carbohydrate will be flat on the bottom and, and fat will be running relatively flat, uh, flat. but at a, at a half decent amount of kilocalories per minute, that's the other thing that you get from metabolic analysis is the fact that you can see that the person's, you know, burning, you know, 9.2 kilocalories per minute of fat uh, versus somebody who's burning 2.8 and you're going, well, you're, Yes, you're using a high percentage of fat, but the actual amount of fat you're using is quite poor. So that uh, that can help us decide how to set programs to get them to be able to burn fat more efficiently itself. Um, there's a point at which uh, carbohydrate starts to rise and they're, they're, they'll be co- both contributing, but fat will be contributing significantly more. And that runs to a point in which the carbohydrate uh, will cross the fat and will start to be a larger contributor than the fat. And that's uh, it's referred to as crossover. Um, if you're, as you know, when you look at your data, uh, that could happen during a single increment during the test. So I don't use crossover as the top of my zone two. Mm. I'll find the point where they lose homeostasis, where where the fat's flat and the carbohydrate's flat. If you get this within a minute, what will happen is you know that if they continued at that heart rate or that intensity, um, they would have crossed. So you're fooling yourself if you think that's zone two because that actually, they, they might be able to run there for a minute and a half, two minutes. And they're going to be in carbohydrate, which means they're in zone three. The, the, the real definition, right, of zone two is that you will you will burn a majority of fat for a significant period of time without uh, having a higher a concentration of, of carbohydrate being used. So I, I'll always look down and move it to the left from the crossover significantly to be able to pick up the point. Um, and then what you're looking for, I mainly use breathing frequency because uh, chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors in the body uh, are picking up elevated levels of CO2. Um, and elevated levels of CO2 are representative of higher levels of hydrogen ions at the muscle itself. So um, when CO2 levels go up, there's a there's a drive within the respiratory system to breathe more frequently. Um, and therefore, you'll see a pickup of the a frequency that naturally happens at several different points uh when they when they switch from zone three to four uh the elevation will be significant and be kind of between 30 and 40 breaths a minute uh and then in zone five the breathing will go you know from 40 to about 50 55 breaths a minute so i look for those changes in the breathing in response hard part is with all the people reading online about breathing (laughs) um they're actually interfering with their chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors from making really good decisions. And they think they're doing something to help themselves and they're not. They're actually interfering with the with the biochemistry in their body. And uh, there's the and then people get buy into this whole idea of well I, I, I yeah, I'm gonna improve my uh, ability to to you know carbo for carbon dioxide tolerance and you're going there's no such thing as carbon dioxide tolerance. You know cells are not going to develop a tolerance for it. What you're doing is you're making it much harder for you to be able to do the same thing. So the only time I can't use breathing frequencies at the higher intensities is when I pick up, and it's really easy to pick up somebody who's using their cerebral cortex to be able to control their breathing instead of their old systems, which were much more uh, effective 
at being able to respond to changes in biochemistry. So th that's how I, I zone. There's no percentage anywhere. Um, and it, it works really well. I, despite the fact that we have, you know, the, we can, we can measure thresholds. I, I don't use them because if you have a threshold, it might be because you have a respiratory limitation. I mean, anaerobic threshold or what threshold? Yeah. So anaerobic threshold is based upon respiratory data. What if the person has a respiratory limitation? Then I don't, that's not their anaerobic threshold. It's, it's a, it's a problem in the limitation of the respiratory system. Mm. And again, it's one number where they'll say there's a rapid increase. And I don't look at single numbers. I look for uh, trends that you'll be able to pick up and are quite obvious to people when they've been taught how to be able to find those trends. So is it the breathing you're speaking back to the, the breath work people are doing? Is that, you know, any examples of that? I know we, you talk in the course about the nasal breathing too much and just how we should breathe through our mouth and not try to work out hard and nasal breathing and any examples on the breath work that you're saying isn't beneficial. Yeah. People believe that breathing slowly, no matter what is good. And they, they don't, this is all taken from yoga or uh, deep diving um, and stuff like that. But that's not what you're doing when you are running or when you're cycling at a high intensity. Um, you're changing your biochemistry on purpose by changing fuel sources that you're using to be able to create ATP at the rate at which you need it to be able to do that task. And natural byproduct of that is elevated levels of hydrogen ions. And you become acidotic at the cell and therefore you will not be able to function. Your body's system to be able to deal with this is to is the respiratory system as a major player. And if you're not allowing your breathing to speed up, to be able to blow off the carbon dioxide and get rid of the hydrogen ions, then you're going to promote the acidosis. And uh, that's it, it, there's all kinds of ramifications and and some of the discussions about nasal breathing. First of all, it's it makes no sense to to use two small holes versus the big hole in your face <laughs> to get the volume of oxygen there and to, to be able to control your breathing. And if you want to breathe slower, you can breathe slower through your mouth. You don't have to breathe through your nose to breathe slower. When so you're exercising. Right. When you're exercising, when, it, it's good for, like, I mean, if you want to calm down, mm -hmm. it will slow down your breathing because you're not going to be able to get as much air in in the same time. So you're going to breathe slower to okay. keep the same volumes. Whereas during exercise, and the other thing is, is this, they'll, they'll falsely promote things like nitrous oxide will help your airways and the nitrous oxide is in the nose has nothing to do with the cellular nitrous oxide. They're, they're totally different constituents. Um, so it, there's a, a complete falsehood with that as well, but it's become extremely popular. I have to spend a lot of time undoing it. Not that I don't think there are respiratory limitations that can be improved significantly through respiratory training. I just don't think it's by breathing through your nose. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good kind of topic to go into. What are the common limitations we see? You're talking the the term respiratory limitations. Let's kind of go into the common ones you see when you're testing. Why is it so important to do the testing to identify these limiters or which to me is the areas of opportunity where you need to focus on your training until you test again to see where, if you are striving to improve. So what are the limit, yeah. your common limiters? Um, I've kind of come up with my own system, which uh, a lot of people are using, which works quite well, which is uh, you either have a respiratory capacity limitation or a respiratory capability limitation. Mm -hmm. I like defining the differences, you know, the, the capacity, if we look at it from a respiratory point of view, is the, what is the amount of air that you can move in your lungs? And, uh, and how quickly can you get that air to leave and fill the lungs? So, the, so I look at things like what's called spirometry, which is measuring forced vital capacity which is um, it's a six-second test to, uh, you exhale after taking a deep breath in, which allows us to be able to measure the functional area of your lung. And then we also look at FEV1, which is the first one second, how much volume can you get out in a hurry? 
And uh, we use those for capacity. Because obviously, if you're going to be breathing 50, 55 breaths a minute, the one second value is going to be really important. How it's You're not going to keep a really slow, deep breath in and breathe out like you will with a, a six second test. But during that one second test, we want to know how quickly you can get stuff in and out. There are sets of norms, of very large pools of norms. So we use what's referred to as the GLI, uh, Global Lung Index. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it does is allows us to be able to put the person's age, gender, height, and ethnicity in. And be able to look at their spirometry results that we get from a simple test. And be able to determine whether they are within the normal for that particular grouping. Um, then we use the metabolic analysis data of how they breathe during movement. And that's the capability. How well can you use the volume you have? So the capacity that you have during the test. And we can, you can find, um, you can find capacity limitations in which they use their capability of using it is, is as good as it's going to get. Then you have capacity. You have uh, capacity limitations, and they can't even use that very well. So they have poor capability. And then you have normal capacity, but they're unable to use it during movement. Mm -hmm. So yeah. my And the reason why it's important is the training needs to be different depending on what you're finding. You can't improve capability if you can't improve capacity if that's the limitation. So my firm belief is that you want to work on capacity if that's where the limitation is. And this is where a lot of the devices that are out now are all resistive based. Um, it's for all about, work. Make, yeah, it's making, like making it harder for you to breathe. Hmm. Um, and if you have a capacity limitation, making it more restrictive is going to make you better at breathing that crappy amount. You know, it, that's not the right idea. It'd be, it would be like saying I'm missing the last 15 degrees of elbow extension. So therefore I'm going to put it on 50 pounds of weight to do bicep curls. <laughs> and you're going, well, that's not going to work. Right? We need to get your elbow to straighten all the way first. Mm -hmm. And in that new range that we gained, you're not going to have any strength or, or capability in that range. So we're going to have to build capability on the capacity. So I'm very, it's a very structured way of doing it, but it works beautifully. And it works on anybody who has a diagnosis of COPD or asthma all the way through to the elite athlete, uh, where you can increase their volumes per minute, what's referred to as VE, by 80 liters a minute. Uh, by adjusting, if they have a capacity limitation and you train capacity and then capability, I've moved people 80 liters a minute and, yeah. uh, and it's moved them way up in their professional goals. Yeah. Um, and it's moved a lot of people that were medically restricted, uh, way up in their function and their, and their longevity as well. So that's, I would consider those as, as the two majors. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's fun is there's a flex in between them. Once you gain one, you're going to have to go get the other one, which is very, it's very physio in a way, hmm. you know, it, it's uh, if I'm going to get you another 15 degrees of range, I've created a monster uh, of which I'm going to have to train you in that new range to get you better. And a lot of it has to do with diaphragmatic mobility, Yeah. right? The, the thorax and the ribs need to be able to move. Mm -hmm. So I think this is why I like my cross background like the my strength and conditioning is very strength and conditioning uh my my mobility is very physio based and then you've got your physiology side of the house so if i want them to be able to increase their capacity i will look at diaphragmatic mobility i'll look at thoracic and rib mobility i'll do manual therapy and manipulation to be able to get them moving better through those areas but if i imagine if i put a device in which i'm turning up the resistance I'm going to stiffen that diaphragm and therefore it's just, it's not going to result in more volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah.
I think it's so interesting because I would say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And I think it's so important as we get older as athletes and we want to improve performance. And, you know, I always say fight the the saying that you get slower and fatter and you can't do stuff because you're getting older. I would say, no, it's just that you have to adjust how you train, fuel train to perform as an aging athlete and not just say, oh, I'm getting older. So we just need to do different things, not, ex- you know, do the same thing over and over again, expect the same results doing the program you've been doing for 20 years. <laughs> That's just not working anymore. Right. So it's yep. good to and identify. You've got to, real- you've got to be realistic with your coaches. Um, you know, if they don't have this data or the capability to do it, and they're not accessing professionals that do, then you are going to get a kind of a very traditional program, which is very appropriate for the event that you're doing, dependent upon your capability, right? So people always get mad at doctors all the time. And I'm going, why are you mad at your doctor? Oh, they didn't do this. They didn't do that. I said, they have four things they can do. (laughs) Did they do at least one of those four things? Did they test it? Did they refer it? Did they inject it and did, or did they medicate it? Because that's the four things they can do. If you're going to see a doctor to see something else, I don't know why you're seeing a doctor. And the same thing with coaches. I, I would like to, I work with a lot of coaches because uh, that that coaching I consider, I've, I've had tons of debates of what the, who's a coach? You know, am I a performance coach or is it the coach is the one that rides with them, that goes to the track and and runs with them? You know, that to me is traditionally a coach. I'm your science guy, right? Mm. I'm the one who will who will test you and I'll explain to you and your coach uh, your your physiological performance and make recommendations on how to tweak the program specific to your race Mm -hmm. to be specific to you. Yeah. I would like to see more coaches just, you know, work, you know, if you want to work with me, Go get tested and do the and from the basis of this analysis, we'll des- we'll design your program, and I want you to go back, you know, every twelve to sixteen weeks and be retested because I need more accurate data. Yeah, and it's a per- perfect life to be able to do it that way. Well, and I'm trying to create. I was trying to figure out the name, but integrated health coaching that I'm trying to connect with naturopaths and physical therapists and chiropractors. You can't help your patient get well just with what you're doing. You need a referral network and how we can integrate all the services together. If our mutual goal is to help the client patient be the best version that they can be and help them reach their goals, well, we need to partner up and integrate all these different services together because you can't just do it all yourself and keep up with it <laughs> to be effective. Nope. So that's huh. so essential. You, you, I think everybody will benefit from a team. That's for sure. And I, I'm with you. I, I work with a lot of uh, naturopaths but, uh, and nutritionists and dietitians, but very specifically on the sports side. Because mm-hmm. uh, if you don't, you know, you're, you know enough that you get frustrated dealing with people that won't be adaptive in their thought process and innovative. And I think that's, uh, you know, people always ask me, you know, well, how do you feel about extreme diets and stuff like that? And I said, I I don't have any problem when they have metabolic syndrome. Um, I think, but that's because they have an abnormal physiology. Mm -hmm. Uh, essentially we need to go to the basement and find the fuse box and turn everything off and (laughs) turn it back on again and and try and reboot the entire system. And, uh, for that, you need to do something extreme for most, you don't have to do anything too extreme, uh, to be able to adjust it. A a classic case is those that have long-term obesity and, and metabolic syndrome. They still have it after they've had surgery. You know, that that's the weirdest thing. You can test them. And yes, they're losing weight at a massive rate because they've limited the the size of the stomach, right? Yeah. But you put them on a metabolic analysis test and they're still looking like a metabolic syndrome diabetic. And you're going, yeah, that makes sense. All you did was change the stomach. Um, so it was it was I've worked with a very uh very influential uh physician surgeon from new york and that's our our discussion all the time is the fact that metabolic analysis will help determine who will need that surgery who would best benefit from surgery 
because when you when you have somebody who's moving at 60 80 beats and they're 90 percent carbohydrate burning you know there's a problem that's going to take a, a severe approach to uh to be able to change that uh, mm-hmm. so i think that's the fun part of working again with medical all the way through to elites is uh, i never thought i'd be interested in medical to tell you the truth but it's 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 a heck of a lot of fun working on it and and you get better with your athletes because of that. Yeah. I think just getting that data to see, Oh, this is what's going on inside. You don't know what you don't know. And if we can get some type of test to look under the hood, to see what your metabolism is doing at rest and during activity and exercise for more people trying to go higher heart rates is essential to know yeah. where to direct them to next. So when we do the exercise test, and I want to touch on the resting metabolism test, when going back to the zones, because I think what fuel source in zone one to zone two, what fuel source are we using? Well, you're you're mainly looking for free, free fatty acids in zone one, right? And uh, y- yes, sometimes there's a goal for fat loss, mm-hmm. though. But a lot of people, it also is is a very good indicator of a recovery intensity. So that's what I like about it is that zone one is all about recovery. And when you're doing intervals uh, at high intensity, it gives you an idea of what they need to get down to to be able to recover appropriately. So you got a team from uh, like a a newbie to a a higher level and you're meeting them at the track and everybody's doing 400s with 100 recovery. You're going, well, if you got 10 of them, two or three are probably going to be okay. But there's going to be people that where the recovery is too long and for some that they never recovered at all. Yeah. So what's what's nice about when you're looking for that free fatty acid level, right? Um, that's will give you a clear idea of when they're really recovering well. And then zone two is uh, you're in you're in that system where you're you're using everything you're producing, you're using well through the aerobic systems itself. So uh, that's that's zone two, zone three. You're getting a little bit of lactate shuttle going on, uh, which but you're handling it well through the system. Uh, the aerobic system are still processing at a rate in which it's not massively increasing your lactate levels. Not that there's anything wrong with lactate. Lactate is next to glucose is a, is one of the best fuels for performance, and people are still confusing lactate as being a limiting factor to performance, and it's not. It's interesting that it accumulates at a massive rate when you change to the last two fuel systems, which are going into ATP, CP, so the creatine phosphate levels at the highest intensity. Um, and people, unfortunately, so many people have seen the, you know, uh, have seen the classic graph of, you know, well, the first three minutes is this and the next, you know, the next or the first... 10 to 30 seconds is CP and you're going, that's not how anything works. I'd like to get rid of that graph for everybody (laughs) is being able to say, if you can do uh, 10 to 30 seconds uh, that at that intensity, it will represent that's the, the ATB being delivered at the most efficient way possible. So you're, you've got, it's a great discussion about efficiency. Um, you need a production rate. I prefer to use that. Um, you need a production, a massive production rate to be able to do that effort for the last 10 to 30 seconds. And that would be your zone five. That's why intervals, when, if you're doing an interval that you can do longer than 10 to 30 seconds, you're probably not in zone five. No. <laughs> and a lot of people will say, um, the, the, well, why do a maximal test? You can do a sub max test and calculate. And you're going, calculate? That's math again. Um, ideally you can take somebody up and you know be able to capture what they're capable of doing for the last 10 to 30 seconds. Um, so, and that's, that will be mainly creating phosphate, uh, delivery as the fuel system there. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. So a good topic is people trying to get faster as they get older. And Dr. Stacey Sims for female athletes talks about, know, less zone two time for females as we're pre postmenopausal and more time doing 
short intensity interval training, which would be zone five down to zone one, and then some time into zone four, which are the high intensity interval training. And so to train your body, as we whole another topic though, decreasing hormones, and I've been diving into this, the owl, we can, how we can improve our fat loss by doing interval training and not to overtrain doing it too much more is not better, but just the right amount of proper interval training. Cause as you said, a lot of people don't come down to zone one and they don't stay in zone five for that 10, 20, 30 seconds. They'll hit that number, but they're not staying there 30 seconds. So any thoughts on how to properly do the short intensity interval training to improve fat loss and for yeah, females versus I, I mean, men? If we, if we look at it as, um, if we if define zone five, right? That uh, you're using... 100% carbohydrate, so you're using no fat. Um, there is some latency that's used, but that's mainly, if you watch that data, uh, if you look at the research, it's mainly with with resistance training, not with interval-based training. Mm-hmm. Um, if you you look at that and you go, okay, what are the physiological benefits of working out? Not the functional limitations. Uh, the, the, the physiological changes are to increase mitochondrial density and capillarization. So um, everybody talks about zone two is doing that. Yes, it is one of the best ways, but zone five does it as well. Um, we need combination so of two and five two. is is magic. But hey, we wouldn't know unless we tested. Yeah. If, if their zone two is fine, leave them alone. Once a week, they'll do it. I think that's the real difference. Is they would find the results would be better if they tested and trained their limiting intensities, right? And they got the physiological changes that they needed. So uh, if it has to do with mitochondrial density, capillarization, and the metabolic systems being able to use, to be able to be working effectively and efficiently, uh, I find there's zone five is usually not met by anyone. Uh, and you're right. The with me, as you know, I'm a firm person to bring them to five, bring them to one, and you can keep your work to rest ratios the same because the length of time it's going to take a let's take a fit person to get to zone five, they're going to get to five slower, and they're going to get to one faster. If you take somebody who's unfit. They're going to take longer to get there and they're going to have a hard time holding it, but they're going to take a lot longer to come back down to zone one to be able to recover. So they're going to get, they're going to get the same length of time in the zone five, but the more deconditioned person is going to get a shorter recovery. Mm-hmm. Not because they gave them a different ratio is because the length of time it took them to be able to bring their heart rates back down yeah, and to get in that recovery zone. So I, I I just don't use, I use work to rest ratios, but they're all based upon this time, the equivalent time, whether it's a one to three, one to four, one to five, the equivalent time is you must, it doesn't, the clock doesn't start ticking until you get into zone one. Yeah. And that goes back and to then, the example of the track workout. You said, you know, I experienced this. I went to San Diego track club workout. It was 400 meter on a track. Everyone goes together. And then they do one, you know, 400 meter, one lap around and then recovery, one lap. And they're all running or jogging. I go, yep. I'm walking. Like, I, can't, I can't get down to zone one and go hard again for 400 meter. I don't know how you guys are actually doing speed work. And so I haven't been going they, there. They so. know what they're doing, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you can't tell me a track athlete knows they're going to show up at the track and they're going to be asked to do 10 of them that they don't gauge themselves to be able to do the task. Rather than saying, no, I want you to be able to get up into zone five, maintain it for a period of time, and then be able to recover. Mm -hmm. Because logically, it will take them longer to get in zone five the first time they do it. Yep. But they'll recover faster. By the time they end, they'll be getting up into zone five by the 10th repeat much quicker, but recovering much slower. And that's, this is normal physiology this is what will happen but each one of those efforts will be maximal whereas if they know what the coach is up to they're just going to go well i'm going to gauge this to be successful with the task 
So yeah, yeah I think it's it's a really easy way of doing things. I, I even developed an app uh, with uh, Roger Schmidt at uh, Moxie on the Garmin's to be able to to be able to punch this in, and it wouldn't start the countdown clock until they got to their zone one. I heard you say that. Yeah. That is that'd be great. So the other thing is zone two. I know back in the day when I started doing Ironmans in 2001, we worked with Phil Maffetone, did the 180 minus your age is your max aerobic function heart rate. And then we started doing the metabolic testing. So we were not guessing around 2005, I started doing New Leaf. And I worked with Mark Allen. I was on his elite triathlon team for Ironmans. And so we trained always by heart rate. I tr- Sally Edwards actually way back before that was... 1995, when we were doing heart zone training, and she taught me, and I helped her with the heart zone seminars, and I did that. So I'm really sounding old, but that's how long I've been doing the heart rate trainings. But we used to always train, even now, everyone talks about zone two or the math heart rate. That's where, as endurance athlete, especially Ironman, marathons, 50K, 100 mile run, that you want to stay. And so training that volume, the benefits of zone two, but then you hear now, as I'm learning from Stacey Sims, for example, that we want to do that polarized training 80, 20. So 80% of the time is zone two, 20% of the time you're doing the intervals. And then there's, you know, Stacey Sims saying 80, 20 within your workout. So you're doing zone two, but then you're finishing with sprints. So any insight on how we should be training and the, for endurance athletes, if they're looking at performance gains? Is it how much in zone two or whatever we identify in their test? Um, As as a natural kind of continuation of what we discussed, I don't guess. Um, You know, one of the things that drives me the most crazy that fits into this is it's March. So therefore I I have to reestablish my baseline. You know, why have a coach just by calendar? You'll know what month it is. (laughs) You know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Get tested, right? What does it normally work out to be? Um, my guys with really good base will do base once a week unless they need it for the, te- for the race, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the thing, you know, how much mileage they need to be able to know that they can do it uh, mentally, physically, right? That needs to be the load there. But they're not going to be doing, they're only going to be doing once a week for me physiologically. They've got it. The real trick with triathletes is, uh, is your baseline for running, physiological baseline for running and cycling, are they different? And I always have this discussion with with them and saying, you, do you think you have mitochondria specific to running? Do they turn off as soon as you get on a bike? <laughs> of course not. Quit, quit doing double base on things. Now, mileage is different because that's specific to the race the that ability to be able to tolerate being on your bike for that period of time at that wattage that's Mm -hmm. different that's race training but physiologically a lot of the people i i look at unless they've had wrong zoning and have spent most of their time in zone three and have destroyed their base because a lot of people don't realize if you do zone three and four you'll decrease mitochondrial density and capillarization Mm. and at either end and you are going to make yourself significantly worse. So you get that, talk about that because that's big. Because I think I always say a lot of people are training in that gray zone, that black hole training, and you actually, it's counterproductive. It is. It's not only not helpful, but it's actually detrimental to your systems. Because you're damaging mitochondria or creating more oxidative stress? You're, you're decreasing your mitochondrial density and your capillarization. Wow. Yeah. And uh, this is why with, with two and five, I, I go in working with triathletes with the hope that base is there. Let, you know, because I want some time to work on strength or, you know, I don't want to find too many physiological limitations because then I can work on things like wattage repeats instead of heart rate repeats and stuff like that. Uh, because I'm not, everybody thinks that everybody who's into physiology is heart rate based only. And I say, no, if you have no physiological limitations, I can give you a program that will maintain your physiology, but then we'll hammer the function, mm. right? Which let's face it, that's wattage on a bike is extremely important. If I can get you to push more wattage, yeah, uh, then it's so much better. And if that can happen in a weight room and transfer, then great. Um, but I would, I would say 
I, I couldn't tell you a percentage. I can mm -hmm. tell you a percentage of athletes that I find that have, and it'll be the middle grounders that have destroyed their base that I have to do a reestablish the base. Um, it, the overtrainers as well. Um, but a lot of the times you, you can work your cardiovascular guys in zone three really well. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and also you, there's always a physiological improvement and a functional improvement. Like if you're doing zone three, it allows you to be able to suffer and it's more race specific. Most people will race in zone three. Yeah. Um, and whereas zone four, uh, will make you faster or be able, or be able to maintain a higher wattage for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Great. So on five doesn't have very much function because you're, you're not drafting and you're not racing at a level in which you're sprinting. Um, so therefore it's more, it's, it's a physiological zone that gives great benefit that people don't realize it's as good as zone two. Mm. And I, my feeling is we'll find out in the next couple of years that it's because it's mitochondrial density capillarization in fast twitch fibers. Mm, that's a big part of it. Yeah, I think Versus there's something slow. to be said about that is the fact that we need to load high enough for a short enough period of time. Uh, I think it's activation of those particular fibers. Hmm. And therefore, we'll see an increase in mitochondrial density and capillarization, in them, which is beneficial overall because they don't not work you know, they're always there to be able to help turn over products of non-aerobic, which I hate the word aerobic yeah. and, and anaerobic, but they use the byproducts uh, to turn back into fuel. Uh, so the more capillaries you have, the more mitochondrial density you have, the better. Hmm. Yeah, that's why I find it fascinating. You know, use it, you don't use it, you lose it if you don't use it. It's like the zone five, that is so we don't, often do that because it's hard. <laughs> it's yeah. challenging and people don't want to push themselves that hard. And I keep, I hear that a lot. And I know I'm trying to add that more in and my routine is doing that zone five and it's hard to get there. You have to be well rested. You know, that's why we want to prioritize your sleep and manage your stress and figure out nutrition. So you have those days that you feel good that I'm going to add that 20, 30 seconds all out because you can't feel like that all the time <laughs> or I don't feel no. like that all the time. <laughs> And thank God there's some research out in the last five years about what if I do my high intensity before I do my low intensity? And what if I do my high intensity after I do my low intensity? And uh, there's nothing clear out there yet, uh, but it doesn't seem to matter either end, but it would be better done after. That's what this it, it's starting to smell like. I'm not mm -hmm. saying if you just go and have a look at the research. There's not much on it. Uh, but it's a it's a really good question uh, that needs to be sussed out a little bit more. And I think part of the problem will be it depends is going to be the answer. It depends on the individual, right? Yeah, it always depends. <laughs> it, it does. It does. And thank God it does. Um, yeah. Because we'll we'll be a, part of the joy of looking at uh, uh, near infrared spectroscopy, like with the MOXIE or the NOX, is the fact you can see them desatting. Uh, so the muscle oxygen plummeting when you're where you're in that intensity it'll drop 30 40 percent so wow. it measures the percentage of oxygen on the hemoglobin all of a mm. sudden your hemoglobin is kicking around 40 percent, and all of a sudden it'll drop down to eight mm. and it's just it, you know that your cellular structure is just ripping the oxygen off the hemoglobin at the cell and you go that happens at the highest intensities yeah. So you, you add that nice little component of the training because let's face it, metabolic analysis is not really conducive to training. It, it's really not easy to be able to do the training with the mask and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're having devices like Moxie and Nox now. And uh, I think Nox is the newest on the market, N-N-O-X-X. -X. Mm. A good friend of mine, Evan Pycon, uh, has really put out a good product that can be worn during training. Mm. And you can actually see these changes of auction delivery and utilization wow. on a small device about that big. Really? Uh, yeah. And it'll measure directly at the tissue, uh, muscle auction delivery and utilization. And for me, I find that to be quite exciting to have something that's reasonable. It's like technology, everybody's bashing it on Twitter and people are really grumpy lately. It's like horribly taking 
pot shots at each other and you're going, I don't understand this. And then you got the lactic boys are all back and you go, oh, I did this for eight years. <laughs> um, and, and you get all that, well, you should, you know, if you're swimming with a watch on and you're an idiot and you're going, I wish people would just keep these weird yeah, they have too much time on their hands. <laughs> it's it's quite awful, you know, and, and people bashing everything else. And you're going, listen, if you want more data and you're going to use it uh, to be able to adjust your training to be more successful, uh, then by all means, what, what, what's the problem to everybody else? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I watch it from the side and then most of the time I just keep my mouth shut because it just irritates me, but I'll, I have to walk away. One day I'll actually be uh go in there but i don't want to waste so much of my time just i know respond. so i just ignore you know, it yeah so we're going to run out of time there's so much to talk about but i do want to tie into the testing how do we figure out how much time they should spend in the strength training versus interval training versus endurance training how do we identify that um from the rmr it's a, it's a good kick in from the RMR. Yeah. So the resting metabolic rate test is, it gives you, uh, it's the gold standard in determining uh, your metabolic rate, which of course is extremely important for anybody who wants to work with nutrition, uh, whether maintain, gain, or lose weight. Um, uh, it, it's the gold standard. But in addition to that, we can look at what percentage of uh, fat versus carbohydrate they burn at rest. And what we're looking for is at least 70 to 30, 70% fat to 30% carbohydrate. Um, by looking at that, we can determine all kinds of issues related to, it could be nutrition or it could be usually training, right? It can be a medication in some cases, but if we look at it as being a mainly a nutrition-based or and or uh, their physiology, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at that and you look at the metabolic rate in relation to others or height, age, gender, you have norms. Um, If they tend to be slow, so the metabolic rate is slow to others, you can extrapolate that they have low lean muscle mass. Now, that's why I use body composition in combination with it. Um, So resistance training goes way up when metabolic rate um, goes down. Because I need to increase the lean muscle mass to increase their metabolic rate back to normal. And that the best way of doing that is adjustments to nutrition and adjust and resistance training. This is where, you know, with diabetics, it, it got to be this big thing of just get them to the gym and let them get, get them lifting weights. And you're going, no, there's some diabetics that have normal metabolic rates or fast metabolic rates. They're not going to respond by increasing the lean muscle mass because they already have good lean muscle mass. Mm. So That's you end up issue. destroying the effectiveness of a particular tool we have just by inappropriately putting the wrong people attached to it. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, I would I would go off uh, body composition and also performance of metabolic tests if their wattages are exceedingly low, right? And particularly for cycling. Um, yeah. And we just look at it and go, oh, we got to make you stronger. You know, you can't top out at, you know, 220 watts. It's You're not going to be successful. So uh, those are the those are the three things I look at to to bring up the prioritization of resistance training. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Unfortunately, everybody calls it strength training, and you know me, I just like <laughs> it's resistance training, and it has there's four different things you can do with it. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of cases, you're going to be looking at hypertrophy for those who have low lean muscle mass, and you're looking at strength for those that have good lean muscle mass but poor output so and it's a total difference in the rep sets and loads that you use and this is my strength conditioning side coming out and thank god pay attention to the research yeah. uh there's tons of really good research coming out on the on different loading for uh hypertrophy strength max strength uh, and power the, the the bad news is hypertrophy is coming in and everybody agrees it's a massive range will be successful. And this goes back to what you said, do something different. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't go to the, you've got to change up your resistance. And one of the best things you can do is just change what you're doing in the, in the gym, yeah. change your loads. You don't have to change necessarily the exercise, uh, but change your loads. And remember that everything that you do in, uh, in triathlon is reciprocal. 
So for God's sakes, don't just squat and dead. It's, uh, you, it, you have reciprocal gait in both of them. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to move to some unilateral stuff. Yeah, for sure. I need that. Uh, and then lastly, the macros, are you able to do identify areas of their carb protein fat based on their RMR and even tying that in with their exercise test? I know this on the sheets that we, we look at the data, you can somehow tell information. Yeah, that one's a little bit more. Um, yeah, it's a little more out there. It's a lot of math in behind yeah, that's the what calculations. It doesn't seem accurate to me. So I just was wondering, how do you figure Say out is, macros? I, I would look a lot at uh, the results during the the um, the metabolic test, the active mm-hmm. test, and look at their needs. You know me, I'm a firm believer in you got to give me two to four weeks of of data on your on how you're eating now. I need yeah. to know where you are now. Otherwise, I don't stand a chance. Um, so I, I usually just say, I don't care what device you use. And for God's sakes, be honest. I'm not <laughs> yeah, most people anybody. are not. <laughs> oh, they're horrible. And then and they, what they're doing, they're fooling themselves, right? Yeah, I know. So it's not fooling so, me. It's, it's you're lying to yourself. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I th- I think I set my macros based upon that. Um and uh and it it's very challenging. There it's you know, you've got uh vegans, vegetarians, you've got people that are doing keto and asking a ton of stuff like that. Uh you got the fasters. Everybody has an opinion on nutrition right now. Yeah. Uh, so it's it gets to be very challenging, that's for sure. I know. We've been trying to dive into that on this podcast, I'm trying to bring on more people that are carnivore because everyone has questions because now it's gone from, you know, paleo to keto, low carb to now strict carnivore. And then, you know, all the fasting stuff I've been trying to dive into because all this information out there isn't designed necessarily for the athlete <laughs> there. So everyone, all these athletes, yeah. are, I think are trying to do this fueling program and fasting based on metabolically unhealthy people that are trying to heal some issues, health issues. If I could say one thing, um, if you think you're going to burn a higher percentage of fat by not eating, by, by not eating before you train, it's wrong. It's your, what you burn is based on the intensity at which you're working out. It has nothing to do with, it's not going to go, oh, I, there's not as much, I'm in zone three and I'm going to be mainly burning carb, but there's not enough carb here. So I'm going to burn fat. Your systems don't work that way. It, it, yeah. In fact, if it, if you put it out there with low levels, it will eat protein long before that, and, and you're going to undo a bunch of other things. So don't think that fasting leads to you using um, more fat. It just is not true. In fact, if you're fasting, you might actually uh, have to force yourself to drop down to zone two. Then you're going to be burning more fat because you don't have the energy on board to be able to produce at zone three. So please yeah, don't go whole... with the idea that you're actually going to change the fuel that you're burning. It's all based upon your intensity. And that's a, a big topic. I mean, that's an hour long conversation <laughs> itself <laughs> because it has been in the last few years of fasted exercise. Do you eat or not? And I know there is research coming out. I've seen posted that is eating before or after it doesn't impact your or fasting doesn't change. What is it? Your performance levels are not altered if you eat or don't eat or something like that. It was like, you weren't, I don't know what it, someone just said about your fueling being fasted. Isn't going to make a difference to poor. No, it would make a difference. You're saying, but, but most performance, but any fat loss, burning fat or not, maybe that's what it was. Right. I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference to burning fat intensity does. Um, in most cases we have more, uh, more than enough on board to be able to train. So for those people that like to get up in the morning and, uh, I'm one of those. I don't eat and I go train. I didn't fast. That's you're telling me I fasted now. And I, you know, I didn't fast. I just been training that way all my life. I just don't like eating before I go out, but I know I have more than enough on board. Uh, and it doesn't mean that I burn more fat. Um, it, it just depends on the intensity I go out at. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. uh, I think that's a big thing. And in, in their measurement, what they're measuring as a feedback of it, it will confuse people. You know, that's, that's, if you really know the question you want to know, um, 
because that's the number one reason I get when I delve down to it about fasting before training is the fact, well, it'll only increase the percentage of fat that I'm burning. Anyway, I can absolutely state without a, without any problems, that is not true. It depends on the intensity. So if you go yes. from two fasted and non-fasted, you will burn the same amount of that's, I guess, what I was trying to say. It was the same amount, no matter what you do. Yeah. Yeah. But that is the whole thing. It comes down to if we, I get up and work out in the morning and I'm not going to have a big meal, but I have my coffee and my water and, you know, feel okay having something in my coffee. But that's a, yeah, been a big, big thing last few years with athletes, not eating anything. And I don't want to break my fast. So I'm not putting anything in my coffee and I have to just drink water. And I don't know. Anyways. I don't want to take let's, too much. Let's start not training for triathlons without having to do that. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, I, know. I working with Ironmaners was just like I mean, love them to death. Um, but uh, it was just you would talk with them, you would test them, you would show them. They go downstairs have a coffee with a couple of other triathletes and see their training program and just completely forget everything and do their training program because oh man, they're getting an extra ride in. <laughs> and you've really got to have the confidence uh in your team around you that uh, for you to be able to stick with the program designed for you yeah so true i know that's why it's hard not to it's easier to train on your own but you want that you know team to have people but i think when you train with other people you're not listening to what your training schedule is <laughs> necessarily what intensity and your heart rate you're supposed yeah. to be in so, all right, let's tell everyone where to find you in your new journey. So I'll be moving to a little town called Gamblesby and Cumbria. So in Northern England, just outside of Penrith in a week. So I'll be living in a nice old church that I bought in 1868. Really? How fun. Yeah, it's been renovated up there and, and be working out, working out of a, uh, a clinic called Absolute Physiotherapy in uh, Penrith. And so I'll be serving that area. But uh, again, I'll be uh, serving internationally anyway, um, as I work with a bunch of other companies and other, and I consult. So for people that get tested, that uh, if they want to know about their data more in depth, uh, for coaches that want to know more about it, I, I set time aside to do international consulting as well. And uh, you can find me at Strategic Health and Performance. Uh, and you can reach out to me there. Super. Yeah, I know. I, I was telling you a lot of my clients live out that way. So we'll send them, a, take a train ride out there and get a real test done and figure out where they are so we can not well, guess for, on a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, for, for people that are interested, uh, I created an education program on metabolic analysis. Um, it was it was. Uh, four levels uh, recognized by ACSM, AFAA, um, and I'll be reopening that again in the near future for those people that want to learn more about how to do the testing and how to do the analysis and then how to prescribe programming as well. Good deal. Well, thank you so much for your information. I'm sure we'll have a lot more questions coming in, so we'll send everyone your way and I think that sounds like a fun adventure. I was going to ask, are you a Canadian citizen? You live in all these different countries. Do you just get a global yeah, I'm, uh, passport? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a proud Canadian. Yeah. Um, but uh, right now I'm a resident. So you have to be in England for five years, then you can become a citizen. But I'm a resident of the UK, but I'm a Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm still Canadian. Born in uh, Winnipeg, lived in Vancouver, but keeping that if it's a backup plan <laughs> we're, we're it. very we're very lucky aren't we yeah so true all right well thank you enjoy your day we'll put all the links in the show notes and we'll answer questions on the youtube channel low carb coaching and more so thanks for your wise thoughts and all your your multiple education sources putting that all together to be the mentor and coach for us athletes trying to improve ourselves Absolutely my pleasure. It's an absolute joy. Hey, my fellow aging endurance athletes, just a reminder, if you like what you listen to today, make sure to share this episode with your community. Head to debbiepotts.net to set up a free discovery call to learn more about my personalized coaching programs 
especially if you are on a mission as myself to improve the aging process and start training to be my best self when I am 80, 90 years old. So I am on a mission to live my best life and be my best self the second half of my life. So if you're on the same mission as me, head over to my website and YouTube channel to learn more ways to improve the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at debbiepotts.net. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again and see you next time.